Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music. Coming up on this week's show, we've got festival announcements from Download and Arctangent. A new band's popped up featuring members of Blink-182 and All Time Low. Ooh, wow, it's like two of the four horsemen making a band together, that's fine. Uh, studio updates from Testament, Tool and Rammstein. Uh, everywhere where there's new music and new albums announced. And album reviews for this week are Kane Hill, but Barshasketh, really hope I've done that justice. Rome and Fever 333, but let's start off with the news. And first of all, it's a big one. Download Festival have announced 43 new acts for the 2019 edition of the festival. Um, I'm going to go through them all because there are a lot of actual big names in there. So far, I haven't really give a shit about given a shit about Download Fest because it looks kind of not for me. Like just looking at the Friday now, you've got as cool as it would be to see. Not even that actually. So it's headlined by Def Leppard, sub headlined by Slash and Miles excuse me, Slash and Miles Kennedy, White Snake, Clutch, which I would actually be super dope to watch. Uh Blackberry Smoke, Tesla, Laugh and Line. And even the like so every time there's a headline where you're like, Oh, I don't want to watch that, I'll watch something else, they've got that's the beauty about download, they've always got another headline somewhere. The other one's Rob Zombie, which I think I'd be the same as many people. Go there for Dragula, and that was it. To be fair, the last album, whose name I forget, was okay. The only thing I can remember from it is Everyone's Fucking in a UFO, which is a batshit song, but then it is Rob Zombie. Um, but the latest, latest names make it sound like a much better event to go to, and I'll go through them. Uh, so you've got Aaron Buchanan, who were friends, I mean, we're best buds. Uh, Aaron Buchanan, Alcest, Animals as Leaders, At the Gate, Bad Wolves, Batuchka. Beartooth, Behemoth, Black Peaks, Brothers Osborne, Kane Hill, Clutch, Cold Rain, Conjurer, Crystal Lake, Deadland Ritual, Fever 333, Godsmack, Ground Culture, Hailstorm, Art of a Coward, Icon for Hire, Interval, Last in Line, Like a Storm, Last in Stereo, <sighs> Love Bites, Municipal Ways, Neo, oh fuck, Neo I was doing so fucking well. What the? Pa- Palais Royale, that's a dumb name, Parting Gift, Red Hook, Skid Row, Skinned, Stone Temple Pilots, Sumo Psycho, Those Damn Crows, Two Days Grace, Tosca, Trash Boat, Twelve Foot Ninja, Vega, and Wolfjaw. There are a lot of good names in there. A lot of really hard to pronounce ones, apparently, but a lot of good names. Um, obviously, it's headlined, like I said, by Def Leppard, joined by Slipknot and Tall. It is June 14th, June 16th, at the usual destination of Donington Park. And yeah, with those latest names, I think it's a lot more, a lot more interesting lineup. Nice to see like some black peeps and conjure my housemate actually messaged me the day it got announced saying hey hey steven conjure black peeps are announced he mentioned someone else as well i can't remember who it was but either way it's looking like a mighty a much better event now for me at least um on the other side of the planet we also have arc tangent festival down there in bristol and i really want to fucking go to this and they've got based like the first iteration of their festival all announced and from bottom to top it is sugar horse oh fuck me voronoi sure hex cut lost in the riots uh oh oh guys big band what the fuck sake wildcat strike letters from the colony big lad great name why can't more bands be like big lad cattle car bomb aiming for enreich Colossal Squid, another great name. Invalid, <laughs> sorry, Invalids Floral L L N N Lin Lin Pigeon Sidhu I A A Williams Azusa Standard Mole uh, Ghost Burton Row A K D K read that The Physics House Band Bosque Conjurer A Frontier, Three Trap Tigers, The Algorithm, The Contortionist, Daughters, Black Queen, Caspian, Zealand Arda, 65 Days of Static, Oh My Battles, Cult of Luna, and it's all headlined by Mushfugger. 
Uh, that's the latest line, line of names. That sounds like a really fun day. It sounds, again, like a hard to pronounce day. Fucking, who names their band LLNN? Come on. And what was the other one? Vornoy. Vor. Oh, she's got too many O's in. Yeah, I don't like that. But Big Lad and Colossal Squid. For, come on. Either way, not to get away from the part that I'm not going to go around naming names. Um, Our tangent looking like to be a lot of fun. Down in Bristol, 15th to the 17th of August. Later this year. Nah. Uh, like I said before, there's a new band on the horizon. Oh, it's... Mm. So it's Blink-182, Mark Hoppus and All Time's... All Time Lows, Alex Garscar. I've probably pronounced that wrong, haven't I? I think there was too many S's in there. Either way. Um, they formed a new band called Silver Creatures. Um, the debut single, Drug, is out, and they plan to have a full EP released sometime in March. I listened to the song. It is very, very pop-friendly pop-punk. And considering it's Blink-182 and it's at all-time low, that's not unsurprising. It does, it does sound like a meeting point between the two bands. It's nothing to... For me, at least, I'm not hugely excited because I'm not the biggest all-time low fan. Really enjoyed California, the last um, Blink album. But I think it is kind of cool that it is two different generations of pop punk working together. Like the rock and metal in general tends to get a bit... A lot of... Actually, no, not a bit of black. A lot of black for not really bringing up the next generation. It happens a lot in rap and hip-hop, but really doesn't happen. you just got some old todger called Gene telling you your shit um, but now for they both got huge followings for their respective bands so I think this is going to do quite well it's bands called Simple Creatures and like I said they've already got a single out called Drug uh, Testament thrash metal icons have been talking about potential for a new release for some time in 2019 uh, frontman I was going to call him Chuck Berry but then that was completely fucking wrong was it Chuck Berry? no it's not Chuck Berry Chuck Berry was the old jazz singer. What the fuck is Testament's fucking fucking fuck? Chuck Billy! Chuck Berry. Fucking hell. Chuck Berry has been speaking to... Did I do that again? Chuck Billy has been talking to Jimmy K from the Metal Voice at the Hall of Heavy Metal History and offered some um, a little bit of detail about the band's forthcoming 12th studio album. The holidays were wrenching it all. Good start. Um, but now we have really started. After the new year, working hard, we should have it out. We should have it out. Hopefully by July is our goal. They've really chopped up this interview, haven't they? Uh, we'll hopefully get it into the studio by April. That's the goal, and it's going to be a follow-up to 2016 Brotherhood of the Snake. I've never really gone in a testament. Of a testament. Testament. I've never really gone in a testament that much. Um, singles here and there. I couldn't name any off the top of my head because I can't even pronounce words, let alone think of them. But after going in more on Andy Sneap recently, I looked at more of his production work and the level of bands he's worked with and what he can do. I think at some point I will go back to Testament. Or if he does work with, um, if Andy Sneap do work with Testament again for this next album, I think I'll really pay attention to that because Andy Sneap is somewhat of a god. Moving on to Tool. And everyone keeps saying there's a new Tool album. Now, they're even saying it. Drummer Danny Carey, who was set up at a booth for some kind of meet and greet signing sort of thing, um, was asked a couple of questions and some guy on YouTube picked it up. Um, asked if there was new, any news on the album and Danny responded with, yeah, it should be out mid-April. Um, before adding, that's the plan anyway. The whole Tool album is a fucking mess. Um, for years and years and years and years, people were blaming Maynard James Keenan. Keenan. Um, but he's come out, or someone's come out and said, you know, it wasn't really his fault for all these years. It's been X, Y, Z. It's been a whole mess of who did what. But maybe after, what has it been? 14 years, 13 years? Which, grand scheme of things, compared to a lot of bands, is not, I think it came out 2006. We're still waiting for a System of a Down album, so fuck off, Tool fans. Uh, and lastly, Rammstein have announced on Twitter that the mixing process has been completed for the new album. I reckon we'll get that this year. And from what I've heard, that's going to be the last Rammstein album. 
And if they keep one was um, Ibis Rolada, that was that probably wasn't even German. That was just what mumbling. Two thousand eight, I think that album came out, so it's been eleven years. And if they continue with that kind of trajectory, I don't see them making another album. I know when Hardwired Self Destruct came out, people were asking Metallica, or people were like trying to guess from Metallica how many albums they had left. But they even came out and said, "We don't want that kind of break between Hardwired and the next album." Uh, I don't see Ramstein going that some sort of way. Till is. Excuse me. Um, yeah, Till is. He's got um, his Lindemann side project or solo project with. Uh, I can see his name written down, but I can't pronounce it. Peter Tadgren? Probably not right. I can't even remember what band he works with, but he's got his solo project there. Um, Richard um, Richard Crust is looking at well by looks of it spending more time with his emigrate side project and yeah I don't see I think this will be the last Ramstein album if I'm honest in my humble opinion but you never know I've been wrong many times before so who the fuck knows uh, as far as like new music it's there's only one standalone this week um, Don Broker released a new, al a new album a new song called Half Man Half God and when it was played to me, I described it as, you know, when you go onto YouTube and you type in a song and you put cover and you inevitably, especially if it's a techno song, you never, well, that's, that's a horrible thing to say, an electro song, you never get like so and so and so rock cover. Half Man, Half God kind of strikes me as a rock cover of the entire back catalogue of the Prodigy. It's really aggressive and like dissonant, borderline like drum and bass, big beat for the verses or like for the breaks. The pre-chorus is fucking wonderful. Like, I mainly have, oh, fuck, I've mainly have only listened to the song once, um, and the fucking pre-chorus still sticks in my head now. It's a wonderful piece of music and then the rest of it is just yeah just mad just noise um i want to give it a few more listens before i say whether or not i like it or not um but yeah i from what i've seen there's nothing attached to it i think it might just be a standalone i haven't seen anything about a new ep or they've only just released technology so got no idea and i think they have a pretty standard trajectory for albums. I think it's every three years for Doddy B. So, who knows? It's, it's a new song. It's called Half Man I've Got. And yeah, check it out. I'm starting to get this poll that everyone else is getting now. I don't like it. Um, in terms of new albums, there's quite more. There's a lot of stuff for me. It's a me week, and I like me weeks. Uh, Blood Command. Last week they had their single. Ah, oh, forgot already. Fuck. They announced a new single. I shouldn't have deleted it, but I'm a twit. Um, they've asked details on the EP to go along with it. So the EP is going to be called Return of the Arsonist, and that's going to be out the 19th of April. Brutus have announced a new album to follow up to Drive. No. Where was Drive? I should really start getting better remembering things. You'd never guess I used to be a student. Either way, uh... Second album coming out soon, it is called Nest. They've already got a lead segment out called War. It is very much a song of two halves, and it's so good. First half is this really eclectic, um, like, post-rock song. And then the second half, it's very much like a four-minute song. The second half explodes into this um, really passionate post-hardcore song. with still, like, the ethereal post-hardcore, post-rock bits from the start lingering around. Um, it's super good. The first album is called Burst. If you haven't heard Burst, go and find it because it's fucking phenomenal. Although I can't remember what the fuck it's called, it is incredible. Um, the new album Nest is coming out the 29th of March. And finally, Employed to Serve have also announced a new album. They had the lead single, Force Fed, out a day or so before. Um, and it's the follow up to, and again, I can't remember. Blood I don't know why I'm so bad at remembering things today, or in general. Warmth of the Dying Sun. I can. It's one of those you can see it in the head and you're just like, oh, 
And um, the follow-up is called Eternal Forward Motion, and it's going to be out the 10th of May. Like I said, I've got this lead single out already called Force Fed, and it is really blistering um, metallic hardcore. They've just signed to... Was it Napalm? Spine Farm. Yeah, Spine Farm. Um, see, lead vocalist Justine, hit, she ran was a big part, or still is, of Holy Raw, which might explain why Holy Raw at the moment are doing fucking brilliantly. Um, and yeah, so I think it's going to be like the major label debut. And for looks force fed, the label have not said, can you, can you, can you quiet him down, please? Can you, can you not? They said, fucking murder everything, have some money, which is always fun. So yeah, that's the latest album. So you got Return of the Arsonist by the EP by Blood Command that's coming out the 19th of April. Nest by Brutus coming out the 29th of March. And Eternal Forward Motion by Employed to Serve coming out the 10th of May. Cool. On to the album reviews. And we're going to start with just just a, just a, just a tid one. Uh, it is Kill the Sun. It is the second EP by the usual usually industrial new metal drungy band Kane Hill but this is like an acoustic experiment uh, blending bits of acoustic rock bits of grunge and Americana and I think they're including it all with their trademark bouncy bouncy groove which I really don't like and I'll touch on to that a bit more in a bit um reading up on the release they said they were inspired by the Alice in Chains EP Jar of Flies from back in the day which is Pretty similar aesthetically. Obviously, Alice in Chains, everyone knows, quite a heavy, grungy band. One of the big four from back in the day. Jar of Flies was their acoustic version. They stripped back a lot of their music and released an EP full of like more acoustic-y based songs. Um, so they've got a lot of inspiration from that. And also the MTV Unplugged series, of which the most famous one I know, well, two famous ones I know, the Corn one, which apparently was shit, and the Nirvana one, which I've heard bits of, and it sounds fucking incredible. So they were really inspired by that level of like strip it all back while still being heavy, but not quite, if you get what I mean. Um, and something that I picked up on with this acoustic EP, as opposed to a lot of other ones, is you can straight away tell that this is still Kane Hill, which is a weird thing to say, but you look at... Uh, an acoustic EP. I don't want to rip on them, but Presto Mico have got an acoustic EP on the way. I think it's coming out towards the end of February. And they've released a couple of songs for it as well, and they're doing like acoustic reworkings. And aside from like their melodies, which make them them, the song sound, because they've had to restructure them for, they are usually quite fast paced, quite technical songs. They've had to slow them right down for this new acoustic EP and I think that's the difference between just covering songs that were never meant to be acoustic and just writing them from scratch um, because the songs on Killer Sun sound like they could fit into any Kane Hill release particularly uh, the last song Smoking Man it's got like a really rhythmically repetitive chorus that I'll, I'll put in my notes with electric guitars would fit right into Too Far Gone I think because it's got like a dissonant electronica outro to it, I think as itself, it could fit into Too Far Gone or any um, previous Kane Hill release. And I think that's quite clever what they've done. They can't. They have still captured the sound that makes them Kane Hill, but in a totally different way. Um, Vocalist Elijah Witts were um, vocals on Acid Rain. They're on par with this kind of singing he's putting into Lord of Flies or Singing in the Swamp with last year's album. And just, like I said, they really captured the sound whilst doing something different. They have played around with a lot of outside sounds in this. So, Empty has got a like a Spanish guitar, so it's got this like weird Latin feel to it. Save Me has like a Serge Tankian style piano lead to it. Acid Rain is a bit more stonery. Um, and yeah, it's just, they are blending around a lot of sounds and they're still, even though it's an acoustic album, they're still putting in that industrial side to their sound. Um, 
I won't give a specific example because it's just literally everywhere. Um, and yeah, it's weird. I've, we'll be coming up with some more like industrial based folk, like acoustic music in a bit. But I think it's quite, quite an interesting thing of what they've done. And like I've said multiple times, they've really captured their sound, even as far as the like subtle industrial bits that they've like toned back on since um, the debut. They've really captured it in this like acoustic kind of way, and so the EP was like they've said before that the whole purpose of the EP was to prove they could write quote unquote proper songs. Um, it's a chance for the band to broaden what they can do or what they are known to do. Um, and in the end, the the grunge influences that they said, so the Alice in Chains, the NCT and Pluxies, they wear those things proudly on their sleeve there is so much grunge in this i was listening to acid rain and i got so much um sound garden vibes it was a chance to prove that elijah could sing he wasn't just like a one-trick pony when it came to screaming and the drummer devon clark plays the saxophone which the saxophone is making the single greatest comeback in modern music it's fantastic everyone's using a fucking saxophone these days apart from fucking shiny but all of this was to get away from the fucking new metal label they'd be lumped with since they came here. And I don't understand. I, nah, that's not fair. I know exactly why they don't want to be labelled as a new metal band. But modern day new metal is not that shit anymore. There's a lot of people, there's, there's not many bands that are just a new metal band. Even Bring the Horizon are using bits of new metal, but they're using it with other things. You've got a lot of... Um, even like I, I rank Issues as one of the first bands to bring back a new metal sound, and they blended it with R and B. Like, there's no out and out new metal bands anymore, and that's a good thing because, yeah, it, it wasn't. There was a lot of trash back in the day when new metal was becoming a big thing. The same way there's a lot of trash now after Gent came and gone. But when you blend it with other things, you make it a lot interesting, a lot more interesting, and it does have a much fatter sound with the PH. But nonetheless, if they don't want a new metal label, let's not give them a new metal label. Let's just enjoy this what it is. It is Kane Hill. It is Kill the Sun EP. I recommend this if you enjoy the influence that they said. So, as in Chains, like I said, I picked up a lot of Soundgarden vibes. I'm also going to throw Ancient Wisdom in there because it's dark, it's creepy, it's spoopy, and it's all acoustic. So, yeah. As in Chains, Soundgarden, Ancient Wisdom. Y'all go for the new Kane Hill EP. It's called Kill the Sun. Okay, moving on to a band, another band that's really hard to pronounce. Why have I got so many of these this week? It is the self-titled album from Barshasketh. I hope I've done that justice. I feel like I've done that justice. And it's the fourth album from the New Zealand, but not New Zealand based. They are New Zealanders. They have come from Scot. They are emanating out of Scotland because I often think when I'm visiting New Zealand that I would much rather be in Scotland, but never mind. Um, they are a black metal outfit from New Zealand via, well, Scotland via New Zealand. And for me, this is my first through and through black metal album. Um, the closest I've I checked back and closest I've been to before was the Unflesh album, which was like episode one or two. And so I want to give like a benchmark, I guess, for me and my relationship with black metal so i might be the worst black metal fan ever which is not the best way to start off a review about a black metal band basically i am a self-proclaimed production snob i i don't like Despite like me really like enjoying punk rock and hardcore, I don't. When it comes to metal, I don't enjoy the old raw sound, particularly in black metal, because I think it just all like sort of fades into like one noise. Which for a lot of people, that's the appeal of black metal. That's why it's so aggressive and dangerous, which is fair enough. But I prefer more, um, I guess, high production. I don't want to use the word clean because black metal is not a clean genre by any stretch of imagination. But that high production line is much more my kind of thing. So as an example, last year Watain came out with Trident Wolf Eclipse. It was highly regarded, a lot of people really enjoyed it, and I it did nothing for me because 
even the like lead single, which was Nuclear Holocaust, I think, Nuclear Alchemy. It was okay, but because it just sort of like all the reverb and the echo and noise, it just all blended into like a noise to me, and it didn't really do anything for me. Whereas The Wild Hunt from 2013, an album which a lot of fans really didn't like because it had a much bigger sound, incorporated folk element, folk elements, and uh, like I said, it was a, a lot nicer on production. I really enjoyed that. In fact, if I went back to listen, go through all the albums of 2013 that I listened to, I think The Wild Hunt might be up there as one of my favourites. Um, and another one, another example is the Big Mayhem album. So, what's it called? It's something like that. D Mysterious De Satanicus, something like that. I've tried to listen to that so many times because of, like, the, not even cult following, just the absolute following that it has. And I just, I can't do it because the production's a bit iffy. And like I said, for some people, for people who are diehard into black metal, that might very well be the thing. More power to you. You like what you like, go for it. But it's not for me. So, as that as my bench post, you can, like, skip on to the next album or do what you want. Just, that's where I start with black metal. To me, this album by Bashke sits more on that well-produced side. Um, you can hear every instrument being played. In all the little nuances, and I'll get more to that in a bit. Um, the album's still full of all like the black metal characteristics that you expect. So it's got sinister growl vocals. Val it's got them growled vocals, uh, tremolo guitar work, insanely thunderous drums, and the drum work in this album is fucking incredible. Um, and there's like drum. Like I said, drum work in this out is incredible. There's lots of little fills or little plays on the rhythm throughout the album that keep things interesting. So in the first song, um, Vacillation or Vacillation, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that word. Uh, there's a section where the prominence is on the bass drum. It's around 1 minute 30. And the way it's mixed and the way the um, bass drum is going, it feels like it's trying to reset your heartbeat. because, Especially on headphones because it's just... It is the most affluent thing that's happening at that moment. And it feels really jarring in a good way, as only black metal can do. Um, and before I go further, there's a section around 250 on Vacillation, where I only heard it on headphones after like a third or fourth listen. But in the background, there is this terrifying, shrill sort of sound. Um, if I can keep hitting my microphone again. I don't know whether it's a scream. I think it is uh, a note on the guitar, so quite low down on the neck, bottom string, stretched, all that, or bend, sorry, all that sort of thing. But it just plays right in the far distance, and it just adds that incredibly terrifying world that you get put into for a black metal album. And it just, it's... There's just always a sound emanating from somewhere. There's no quiet um, level in this album. And yeah, just little, like I said, little things like that. Uh, Into Ruin 2, in the middle of the full fee, like Black Metal Barrage, all that blast beats and that kind of thing. The drums aren't just doing like the fast double kick bass, like. I can't, I can't double kick because I'm wearing socks. Um, yeah, it's not just doing that, it's doing more like rhythmic two shots, so like. Some I I really really enjoyed that. I must have like just skipped over that part so many times just to like go back and listen to it, listen to it, and listen to it. And then similar sort of thing happens again in Rebirth, where it's just more. I didn't make a note like the time stamp on it, but there's just more short bursts of bass, it's like little triplets instead of just like the constant stream. And it just to me it felt more chaotic and a bit more offensive because it just feels kind of like artillery, which is really cliche to say about drums on a black metal album but it is everyone feels like, like low rumble when it's just like double kick bass when it's just like it just feels like you're physically being attacked um, all the little nuances and all that like plays with the time sort of thing I would not by any means consider this a progressive album this is just a very intelligent black metal album to me um, I do enjoy the fact that the mood and the atmosphere of the album Excuse me. Um, it, they seem to come exclusively from the instruments. 
And I've looked up more about Basha Skeff, and they do have two members of the band who do um, synth work on the um, album. But I didn't really notice it. I didn't really spot it or like pick up on it. It feels like it's very organic sound. So it's all coming from like the shrill guitars, the really interesting drum work, the eerie vocals. The only complaints I really have about the album is the first half of the album is a bit of a slow burner. It tends to pick up uh, track four, um, Consciousness, Consciousness 2. Um, first, three, first three or four songs, like I said, are they're interesting, but they just don't have the same effect as the second half. And... I feel like a dick say this because I think it might be more me than the album but in the moment when you listen to it this is a very ferocious album you know the usual head butting a building biting the head off an orphan that kind of church burning stuff as soon as it stops though I didn't want to go back in straight away I didn't want to repeat the album which as like a retrospect when I was reviewing the Tally's album last week as soon as that finished I was more than happy to start from again and listen to it all the way through to try and pick up anything else that I missed. I don't know whether that's just because I'm not the most well versed with black metal or what, I'll be very interested to find out what other people think. For me, it was a case of as soon as it finished, I was like, I need to listen to something else because it's, there was just so much going on. Um. But like I said, I feel like that's more of a me thing because I am a well-renowned pussy. But like I said, I'll be if other people find it because it's getting weirdly bad reviews online, um, at least the places I looked, which I think is unfair. This is a really, really interesting album. And I know interesting is usually reserved for oh yeah, it's really interesting when you really want to say it's really shit. But this is genuinely a really, really cool album. Um, with my limited knowledge of um, black metal. I'd say I compared it a lot to Behemoth more than Immortal, but because, like I said, it's got that like dark atmosphere behind it. So I think Behemoth, Immortal, and a newer black metal rap band that came out in the last couple of years called, and they're in German again, Der Weg einer Freiheit. Um, yeah, I got that right. They're another band who like sort of like build up tension and ambiance just for their um just for their instruments and their like extra production and they do they don't just like stick to everything needs to be the same they do like to put in this little like twists and variables here, here and there so yeah, Immortal, Behemoth, the Vega, Iron Freiheart if you like any of them I really think you will enjoy the self-titled album from and one more time Barsha Skeff it's just too many S's I can't deal uh, moving on to Still a dark and creepy album, but literally the opposite end of the scale. Uh, the project is called Rome, and the album is called Le Signori di Heliodoro. <sighs> These fucking names this week. It's a 13th album from the Luxembourgish uh, neo folk, dark folk ish uh, project. It is masterminded by a gentleman called Jerome Reuter. Really hope I pronounced that right. Um, and yeah, he basically arranges everything. And God help him, because what the fuck's going on in his mind? It's sonically, it sounds like it's soundtracking battles of axes and swords and important people called Richard. Whereas lyrically, it diaries stories and um, has themes centered around 20th century conflicts. So see the world wars. Um, even samples, I, I'm not au fait with my German uh, aircraft, but the really stereotypical, yeah, that sounded awful, uh, that aircraft, you probably know which one I'm on about, it soundtracks that more than once. Uh, it opens with a hearty speech that kind of reminds me of when Christopher Lee narrated for Rhapsody of Fire for a couple of releases. And it goes into a new unfolding, which is the first of several times where there's like a call and response segment in the album. Um, and it works well. I, it's, this is a scene that I know very little about this like dark neo 
industrial folk sort of thing. Um, but I imagine like festival appearances, he can get a good, good response from the crowd with some of the parts in here. Um, and yeah, as like a thing for neo folk, it's described as folk music with an industrial influence. When I went looking on YouTube to try and find like other contemporaries like this, industrial folk is a million miles away from neo folk, which is a weird thing to say. But with this kind of music, it's folk music with just with that industrial backing, like little um, drum bits or just adding an extra layer to the sound. Whereas there's people who take the industrial side of things to literally, and it isn't just a slow down industrial album with a bit of acoustic guitar on top of it. So this is a predominant, like it is a very much an acoustic led, quite often quite broody folk music with that industrial backing. And like I said, there's, it's got syncopation in the drumming and a song like Black Crane, or which I think Black Crane is a song that talked about pigeons. It is. It talked about pigeons a lot, which first few times I listened to it, it didn't just fucking throw me. It fucking yeeted me out the build out the window. I just didn't understand. And when you listen to it in context, it's all about like carrier pigeons, and it's just I think I think it's about carrier pigeons because it's based on like what the rest of this album's about. But when you start hearing about pigeons, it does throw you a little bit. Um, anyway, syncopation in a song like Black Crane, the eerie electronics that carry the song in Fliege wie Vogel. Probably mispronounced that like high heaven. And it's sort of with those like juxtaposing genres, um, Reuter has been able to create some like huge dramatic songs. Um, I spoke about Black Crane earlier, it's like a brass backed, it's a lot, a bit more upbeat sounding than the rest of the song, but it's a huge, huge sounding song. Um, oh fuck. Track five. I'm not going to try that. In fact, no, I will. Uh, hmm. Find, 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 bur, track five. It's just the umlaut on the U fucking throws me. Track five on the album is a cynical, it's a group trade-off kind of song. And it is, it's fucking, grim is the wrong word, because grim makes it sound like it's a shit song. It's fucking not, this album is incredible. And it's just bleak, I think. Bleak is a better sound. A little bit better word for the sound. Bleak. The penultimate song is this big swelling war song called Europa o Morte. Again, languages. Fucking Luxembourg has. I have a Luxembourgish friend, and I think she said she can speak English, German, Luxembourgish, which apparently is her own language. A little bit of Portuguese, but I think that's for a different reason. And I think there's French in there as well. So if they know so many fucking albums, that albums, so many fucking languages, it's really fucking annoying when they put Bleeman into one. Um, and it culminates in this in Vulture, which is, it sounds like like a war anthem or a national anthem being played over top of some kind of OG recruitment video. It's kind of unnerving. As a whole, though, this album is a very dark, it's quite cynical sounding, but it is super pompous and super dramatic. I really, really enjoyed this, actually. And... For the part of me that's meant to say like, oh, if you like this, you'll enjoy X, Y, Z, or whatever. This is a scene that I've found out about with this album. So, there was, what was the band called? I did find one, like, contemporary that I could, like, make uh, comparisons to. A band called Estampi, which I don't know too much about. But from, from me, I feel like if you are into this style of music you will already know of Rome but if you want if you enjoy the folk if you enjoy folk music as a general in general but you want something a bit I guess a bit darker and a bit more emotional which I know is easy for me to say when it comes to folk music I think you'll really really go for this um, it's called La Sineri di Heliodoro, Heliodoro. ah uh, it's by Rome, a project led by Jerome Reuter, and I think it's fucking brilliant. I really, really do. Cool. On to this week. I, uh, may, I'm going to call it a main event, because I've, I've been waiting for this album for quite a while. Um, it is Strength in Numbers, with all the fucking weird threes. 
Strength and Numbers by Fever 333. It is the debut album from the California based uh, rapcore supergroup. Uh, the supergroup is made up of members from Night Versus, The Chariot, and Let Live, which is a band that I hold near and dear to my cold, dead heart. Uh, it comes off the back of the debut EP made in, made in America that came out last year. At the time, or some point last year, I ranked this as my well, ranked that as my EP of the year. In hindsight. It's kind of sour in my opinion. When I look back at it, there's only a couple of songs that I listen to on repeat. And those are the songs that I feel like they were written with time. And the rest were just sort of like kind of filler. Which is a horrible thing to say. But Made in America and Walking in My Shoes feel like just put together better. Which were, admittedly, they weren't the main singles. But they feel like they were put together better than, say, excuse me, like a song like We're Coming In. Or point of view but that's just me um, and I think it's definitely that EP is definitely sounding on me more listen to this because of that production I said about before with John Feldman in a previous episode so John Feldman is the Goldfinger singer slash guitarist he has produced some of the albums he's produced is Ungrateful by Escape the Fate he did Cardiology and Youth Authority by Good Charlotte he did uh, Veil and Richard and Divine by Black Veil Bride. He's worked with Five Seconds of Summer, The Used, Blitz Kids, Plain White Tees. And for me, a reputation like that is not what I wanted to have associated with the guy he used to sing and Let Live. And like, I'll, I'll throw my hands up here. It was really hard to separate Let Live from this project because this is not Let Live at all. Let Live is dead. Um, but either way, to have that backing along with Jason Allen Butler, I was, and looking back on like what he's done before, I was very, very, very tre um, trepidatious in terms of like moving forward. Then I heard the remix of Made in America. It was with John Feldman and Travis Barker of Blink-182. And that... The single of the remix sounds so much fucking better than the original. It's got that like big bass backing behind it. Um, even with the like rap verses in there now, I still m hugely prefer it to the original. And then when Burn It came down, which is the lead single from Strength in Numbers, it was a similar sort of thing again where Travis and Feldman worked together and it made for a lot more angry rock sound. So when... It was when I read that Travis Barker was sticking on board for the entire album, I was a lot more hyped for it. And I was a lot more hyped for a more aggressive sound. This is the point where I was still like having trouble separating Jason from Let Live. What this album is in like when it eventually came out is very pop inspired rap core. You've got a song like Animal, which has the millennial whoop in the chorus. So that's kind of what you need. Um, there's a lot more electronics in this album than expected. Uh, for whatever reason, I just did not notice them that much on the EP. I know there's um, the song he did with Yellow Wolf. That's got a lot of electronics. I kind of expected that from like working with a out and out hip hop star. And I, personally, I just don't think they were as prominent in the EP. But there we go. It's to the point where like the electronics in the album range from being very hip hop based, so in songs like One of Us and The Innocent, they are much more they create a much more hip hop sounding sound. Whereas in Inglewood and Coup de Talk, it's more R and B, which I think suits Jason better, because he's got such a first time, such an incredible voice. I think that softer, more R and B style vocal suits him better than try to keep up with like a uh, shout rap for hip-hop that's just me unquestionably though jason is the ringleader to this project uh lyrically it's it's spreading that political message it wants to get across about things like pr police brutality and inequality um and you've also got much more personal songs like again like inglewood which is all about him growing up in la um 
musically, it frames his vocals to show his range. So I said about before, in the more R&B parts like Inglewood, he can sing like a fucking angel. And then there's other parts like in Burn It or Pray For Me where he can really get a strong scream or... Um, and there's a song where he can just get the like the rap side of him out. Is this check? This is very much easily. I think they could have promoted this as a Jason Alan Butler solo thing instead of a group a uh, super group project. For me, the best tracks on the album are the slash three songs. So you've got "Pray for Me," which oh my god, the chorus in this fucking song is incredible. The strength he has behind the delivery for the words pray for me is unreal and it's the sort of thing that's stuck in your head for the rest of the day it's fucking unreal and then you've got Inglewood slash three which is like a seven minute ballad it's kind of split into two halves so the first half of the smooth r&b and it's got like little bits where he does he's a bit more aggressive a bit more sharp but overall it's quite a smooth r&b kind of sound very delicate chorus and then the second half is, yeah, where it's a lot more. It's kind of sound more like a bad issues B-side. So for me, the song should have stopped. I think all three of the slash three songs are guilty of it. You've got like the bulk song and then you've got like a little bit at the end. The little bit in the end of every single song probably doesn't need to be there. Um, like I said, for Inglewood, it sounds like an issues B-side. For Out of Control, which is the third of the three. Um, in my opinion, the weakest of the three, the first two minutes are very confrontational rap core, and then it sort of like bounces between like a low dub into like fast pace. Oh, sorry, it bounces from low like a low dub fast pace hip hop into a huge, more uplifting callback chorus. Um, I think that was the one off the top of my head. That was the song where I thought the first half should have gone, and they should have kept the second half. But yeah, it's, for each of those three, it feels like they're trying to mash two songs together. But the the song that takes up the most amount of time in each of the three, or like the part of the song, I should say, that takes up um, both of the songs, that's all the ones that should stay behind and then just trim off all the excess. Personally, you could have had it like two minute bout of like interlude or just do what Papa Roach did and have a random two minute long sorry no like 90 second long hardcore song in the middle of a rap album fuck it yeah a lot of the um, pop elements of this album comes in those three songs as well um, a lot of the work for the entire album has gone into those choruses and it's exactly what pop music's supposed to do it grabs you in with those hugely powerful huge catchy choruses and then it takes you on a journey. It takes you about all the band's personal message and verses later. And that's how Jason wants us to get his message across now. And that's okay. Uh, I think... For what he wants to talk about... It is very... Um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Very relevant. There we go. It's very relevant for, for what's happening at the moment. And... Like, there's a lot of people from both sides of the coin. So a lot of alternative fans, a lot of um, more contemporary fans, at some point were into Let Live, whether it was The Black is Beautiful or Fake History or um, If I'm the Devil. So that band got a lot of attention. So a lot of that following will follow Jason into his new ventures. And they'll hear this. They'll also have new um, a new audience with songs like Inglewood, which I think... If, J if FIFA 3.3 do want to spread this message, I think they should release Inglewood as a single. Because that will bring in a lot more contemporary listeners. This is, as a whole, because of those choruses, it's a super catchy album. There's a lot of fodder on it, I will happily say. But the choruses throughout are so strong. Um, and if I can be a shit heel little analytic, I would say if Jason does want to spread this message of... Well, in a way, that's all-encompassing rap core sign away. So he's bringing in people from uh, the mainstream and also keeping the alternative fans happy. I would personally say bring in the producer of the last Let Live album, uh, If I'm the Devil, a gentleman called Justin Pilbara. 
Now, on paper, I can completely see why Feldman would be the best person. Like, his albums are very pop-centric and very... Uh, usually, the core fan base will go against the album because of how much it's... how clean it is and that kind of thing. So, I can see why bringing Feldman in would be, a, in theory, a good idea, especially if they were to bring in more, more people. But... A lot of people consider If I'm the Devil to be uh, Let Live's softest album, which I, I agree with. But the songs of that album that could easily fit in with uh, just oh, fuck now, basic radio, um, and it just it appeals to a much bigger audience if, than If I'm the Devil. Um, let's see if I can find, because again, Trying to think of things. So songs like "If I'm well, the track title "If I'm the Devil," a uh, couple called "Quiet." They are so much more like foreign cab rides as well. It's where they're not quite R and B because obviously this, was, this wasn't what "Let Live" were about, but they were a lot more um slowed down, laid back, chill songs, and I think adding that kind of production style would work better than working with Feldman because he can do the choruses, but a lot of the time, it, like I said, the verses on some of these songs do let the album down, but I think for a first, al first album, as, and it might be a super group, it might have three great musicians there, but at the end of the day, this is still just their first album so I think they can only go from strength to strength from here no pun intended with the strength in numbers but the way that they are they're not calling the performances shows or anything like they are called demonstrations they've got the uniform of like the um, jumpsuits they are visually all there that you need and I think I think well they're to put in perspective how I keep blagging on about you need to get Pilbro in, you need to do this, you need to do that. They are already main support to bring the Horizon in their arena tour. Like, may, I'm, fucking, maybe I'm wrong, they're already doing it, but that's just, like, you know, my opinion. That's what I'm fucking here for. If you enjoyed the King Blues, back when they were good, uh, there's a lot of Rage Against Machine in this, and I like my outsider one if you really enjoyed the 100. I think you really go for this. Um, like I said, a lot of like poppy bits in there, but there's also a lot enough there to keep you satisfied if you are more fan of um, the hardcore side of rapcore. Pray for me if nothing else does this out because God. Um, so yeah, that was Strength in Numbers by Fever 323. Um, all these albums are out now. That's Kane Hill, Kill the Sun, Barsha Skeff, that's titled Rome. Oh, fuck. Rome, the scenario de Heliodoro, and Shrink the Numbers by Fever 333. That is everything that I've got to say for this week on the Best Latest Sounds podcast. Next week, I'll be back with. What am I going to do next week? I think the Teal album, the surprise album from Weezer. I'll look into that because it's been so much fucking fun to listen to at the moment. And the big one will be Ammo by Bring the Horizon. And I have many thoughts and opinions.